Okay, let's uh, share what I found when talking to you about these questions. Question one, why does this poem have such long lines? I talked with one group who chose this question. Uh, the one answer they gave was basically what I said last week, which is this is part of Whitman's style. He just likes to use long lines uh, for all the reasons we discussed last week, right? He's trying to create a collective subject. He's trying to welcome the reader into his collective subject. Uh, he's trying to give all different kinds of ideas and experiences to the reader. Okay, all good. Another answer this group gave was that um, these long lines fit the subject of the poem, right? The subject is, or the topic, the theme is that the speaker spends all night accompanying this dead soldier. It's a vigil strange. It's, it's uh, very different. It's very unusual. And it's the entire night. So when you read these long lines, it kind of feels like this long night, right? Um, if we have shorter lines, it feels like the time is passing faster. But in this case, every long line feels like another long moment in this long night. Uh, and in fact, it's not just the night is long, it's the speaker is in this environment. They are like, they, they, they can't speed up the night. There's nothing the speaker can do to make the night go faster. And in fact, I'm pretty sure the speaker would not want the night to go faster. The very point of awake souling like this is to uh, have one last moment with the dead person. So it's like uh, the long night is one final night together. So it's not just about dead time. It's about how the speaker spends this time and the speaker spends it with thinking and feeling and observation. And that's another reason, uh, according to this group, why these, li these lines are so long. Right. They're full of the speaker's thoughts and experiences and memories throughout this long night. Uh, and then finally, this group mentioned that when you have such long lines, you can do uh, one of Whitman's favorite things, which is repetition. So like if you look at this line, this is line seven. Found you in death so cold, dear comrade. Found your body, son of responding kisses, never again on earth responding. We have repetition, right? Found and found, responding and responding. So like, what is this repetition doing? The first found is found you in death. The second one is found your body. It's the same situation from two different perspectives. One is very abstract, right? You're dead over there. And then the second one is very concrete. I see your body. It gives us an image. So it's one situation, one event from two different perspectives. First is the surprise of death. And the second one is the fact of death. Same for responding, right? Son of responding kisses means in the past I would be able to wake you up with, with physical touching and kisses, but then never again on earth responding. So again, it's a different perspectives. One is in the past. I used to be able to wake you. The second is in the present. No more will I be able to wake you. Now, these ideas could be put in different lines. But if you put them in different lines, it feels like two different things, two separate events, two different moments in time. By putting them all in one line, this repetition, these different perspectives, they all feel like the same moment. At the same time, the speaker 
uh, discovers this boy dead and discovers his body. At the same moment, uh, he remembers waking him before and realizes this boy will never wake again. So it all fits together in one moment. And in fact, by putting them in one line and like having the reader read them very quickly in the same line, it puts us in the speaker's position. We too are discovering at the same time the fact of death and the body of the of the dead boy. We too are thinking about how he used to respond to kisses and now no longer responds. Um, so these are some of the reasons that this group gave for why these lines are so long. I personally have one more reason, uh, which is it's more of a performance with these long lines. If you try to read this poem, right, when we reach the end of a line, it's natural, or in fact, we have to break, right? Our eyes have to have time to go to the next line. But with these long lines, when we read it, we keep going and going. So when we perform it, it goes faster and it, it is therefore filled with more energy. It's more of a performance. Vigil strange I kept on the field one night when you, my son and my comrade dropped at my side that day. One look I but gave, which your dear eyes returned with a look I shall never forget. One touch of your hand to mine, O oh boy, reached up as you lay on the ground. Then onward I sped in the battle, the even contested battle, till late in the night relieved to the place at last again I made my way. Found you in death so cold, dear comrade, found your body son of responding kisses, never again on earth responding. Right? It has more of that energy, more of that emotion. Uh, and this fits with what Whitman is trying to do with his poems. He's not trying to make you think. He's trying to make you feel. Uh, and then, of course, when you have such a long line, you can then hide the key moment inside one of the, two of these long lines. Vigil final for you, brave boy. I could not save you. Swift was your death. I faithfully loved you and cared for you living. I think we shall surely meet again. And just like every other image and every other thought in this poem, it is a passing thought. Uh, but one that uh, a group caught, which is there's a an, there's an element of self blame. I could not save you. But just like every other thought, like usually we think self-blame is a very heavy thought. It is a very all-consuming thought, especially for someone who is grieving. But in this poem, it is just one of a number of thoughts. It passes by just as quickly as all the other thoughts. It's hidden in one of these long lines. And it sort of gives us a bigger perspective. Right. This is kind of like the only part of this poem that is focused on the speaker. Yes, sometimes the poem says the speaker does this or the speaker does that, but this is the only part of the poem where we see what the speaker is thinking and feeling. Like the emotional aspects. And so by hiding this element here in the middle of the entire poem and one of its longest lines, it tells us that there is a bigger perspective. Uh, and this is related to how the poem uses nature, which we will talk about later. Question, oh, we will talk about now, uh, Whitman's use of nature. Right, so this was a popular question, I think because the first poem gives a very easy answer. Uh, the first poem is about how Whitman or the speaker is sitting in a lecture hall listening to an astronomer and then unaccountable, I became tired and sick. Unaccountable means I don't know why. There, it's un, there's no accounting for it. There's no reason for it. So uh, the speaker feels tired and sick till rising and gliding out. 
I wandered off by myself. So the speaker isn't like angrily leaving, right? How can you be so boring? No, the speaker is kind of like, like gliding out kind of with no real purpose, with no real destination, just kind of wandering off. It's like the speaker just doesn't want to be here. Anywhere else is fine. And so they kind of like float away. And then they find themselves in the mystical moist night air. Mystical. Sanmida. It means it's hard to explain. And from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. So it's not like the speaker keeps staring at the stars, right? Speaker is still wandering here, wandering there. But sometimes, once in a while, they look up at the stars. So we get a sense that the speaker is it naturally, sorry, gravitating toward nature. They feel attracted to nature. Uh, they feel like they belong out in nature. When they don't have anywhere to go, they go outside. Uh, and the stars are like a silent company. They're accompanying the speaker. Perfect silence, they don't say anything, but the word perfect also would apply to the entire situation, right? Wandering around outdoors at night with the stars for company feels perfect. So nature as a kind of home, nature as a kind of Comfort. Um, most groups said something like this about the second poem as well. We have imagery, right? Again, nighttime. And we also have the stars again. Starlight. But then we have an, a cool night wind. Fragrant, sorry, fragrant silent night. Uh, and so this is the situation as the speaker is accompanying this dead soldier all through the night until finally, uh, where is it? The sun rises, bathed by the rising sun. And then the speaker buries the soldier in the chill ground. So again, if the speaker is spending all night keeping this dead soldier company. Then nature is also there. The night sky, the stars, the wind are also there to accompany the speaker. If the speaker is trying to give the dead soldier spiritual comfort, then nature is also giving our speaker spiritual comfort. Um, but one group has a different interpretation. One group said that because the stars are silent, because nature doesn't actively do anything, nature is just the same, whether um, the soldier is alive or dead, feels like nature is cold and uncaring, or at least separate from the realm of the living. It's like humans are one side and nature is the other side. And in fact, we, we can make the same uh, interpretation of the first poem, right? Nature is mystical, hard to understand. It's not human. In fact, it is the opposite of human. Human approach to the stars is like the astronomer, right? Proofs and figures, columns, charts, diagrams. Whereas nature is just there. It's not human, not part of the human world. Uh, and so whatever positive comfort you get from nature is actually not from nature. It is from being outside of your human situation. Like in the first poem, nature is where the speaker goes when he can't take the lecture anymore. The point is not entering nature according to this interpretation. The point is leaving humans. In the second one also, if the human realm is war and dying, then the speaker gains comfort by leaving the human realm and focusing on the non-human nature. 
So it's not like nature itself is comforting humans. It's simply offering a, a space outside of the human world. Uh, and then finally, in the some groups also also mentioned that in the second poem, nature plays the role of uh, showing time. The first poem is very short. There is no real. There is a small hint of time, right? It says from time to time, but it's really a short poem. We don't really feel the time. But in the second poem, the speaker uh, accompanies the dead soldier all night. So we know that time is passing. And yet. Until the sun rises, the nature of the night is basically the same. You have the wind, you have the. It's a cool wind and you have the stars in the sky. And yes, the stars move. But if you don't know a lot about stars, you may not notice. So all through the night. Dead soldier speaker and then nature surrounding them. So in fact, nature remaining the same is what gives us a sense of time passing. The fact that nothing changes is what makes us feel like time is moving on. Isn't that strange? Usually we say that time is passing because things are happening. But here time is passing because things are not happening. Uh, one group mentioned that um, it's also related to these long lines, right? So many lines where nothing really happens. Uh, it also gives you a sense of how slowly this night is moving. Um, in fact, this is a uh, now a common literary technique, especially in fiction. Uh, I think one of the famous uh, uses was by Chekhov, Chekhov, also early 20th century, or not also, but like early 20th century. Basically, if he wanted to tell you that time is passing at night or whenever, he would say, and then a dog was barking in the distance, which has nothing to do with the plot. But because you are spending time reading about this unrelated dog, you are spending time. And so it feels like the story is also spending time. So again, by presenting something that is not directly related to things happening, it makes us feel like time is passing in a very paradoxical way. Question three, sense and reason. So, you know, Whitman's poetry is not hard to understand. Dickinson's poetry has a lot more space for interpretation. Usually we say that her poems you are an extended metaphor. The whole thing is a metaphor, one long image describing something else. So when she says, I felt a funeral in my brain, it's probably not a real funeral, right? It's in her brain, it's in her mind. So it's like, it's like there's a funeral. So some kind of situation makes her feel like there's a funeral. Mourners to and fro kept treading, treading. So she's hearing, or I guess feeling people walking back and forth, back and forth till it seemed that sense was breaking through. And this is the first Dickinsonian abstraction that we reach. She really likes to use words in abstract and open ways. So, okay, up to the third line, uh, pretty fine, right? Feels like there's a funeral, feels like people are walking. They keep walking back and forth, walking back and forth. It's kind of annoying until and we're expecting something bad to happen, right? Like, I can't take it anymore. But instead, the poem says, until it feels like sense was breaking through. So this is the extreme situation. When the speaker can't take it anymore, it feels like sense is breaking through. Very interesting. Let's keep that in mind as we keep going. 
And when they all were seated, a service, so like the, the priest is like giving a funeral service, uh, a service like a drum kept beating, beating. So again, the funeral is kind of annoying. The person talking feels annoying, keeps going and going till I thought. And then the extreme situation is my mind was going numb. So like it when the speaker can't take it anymore, it will feel like my mind is going numb. This one I think is more understandable. Like if you're listening to me talking and I keep talking and talking and it's so damn boring, you feel like your mind is going to shut down, right? But in terms of these two stanzas, these two lines are portrayed as equivalent. They are both the extreme situation that might happen when the speaker can't take it anymore. Sense breaking through and mind going numb. These two look like opposites, but the poem says that they are the same thing. Let's keep going. And then I heard them lift the box, so the coffin, Guan Tai, and creak across my soul with those same boots of lead again. So again, they're walking around. Then space began to toll. To toll is like a bell ringing, but here it's not a bell, it's space. So it's like the speaker is hearing like a ringing sound in this space. It's like something is going to happen, right? There's, it's a, it's a sign that things are going to change or something is building. Began to toll as, which means as if, all the heavens were a bell and being but an ear. Being here means uh, existence. Everything that exists is all one ear listening to the heavens, the sound of the heavens, the sound of this bell. The image we get here is like this sound of the bell is so ubiquitous. It's everywhere that the speaker cannot help but listen. There's nothing else but this sound of this bell. And I and silence some strange race wrecked solitary here. So among all of these, uh, this ringing sound, the speaker and silence were left here. Solitary means alone, wrecked. Some strange race, race here means a kind of person. So the idea is it's like they were uh, the speaker and silence were kidnapped and taken away by strange people and they're shipwrecked and they were left in this place alone. So the, the, we get a sense of isolation. When all the heavens and all the space are tolling, are ringing, the speaker and silence are left alone here. There is no other place for them. There is no other space, no other place for the speaker or for silence. So this is the extreme state, right? There's nowhere else to go. So finally, and then a plank in reason broke and I dropped down and down. So now something is happening, right? Out of this extreme situation, the speaker is falling. And notice falling through reason. Reason is what stopped the speaker from falling. Now that reason has broken, the speaker falls and hit a world at every plunge. So every fall, every time they're falling, it's a new world. It's something unprecedented. It's a different kind of existence. It's a different mental existence. And Finished knowing then. This is a very, very interesting line. Finished knowing. OK, so the word knowing is related to the word sense. It's related to the word reason. Finished knowing, so there's nothing left to know. Not like the speaker knows everything, but like 
I am done with knowing. I no longer have to know anything. Then, does this word fit with the previous sentence to say, and then I finished knowing? Or is it the beginning of a new sentence? After I finished knowing, then something else happens. We don't know because it's surrounded by two dashes. We have no information about whether this is the ending of the poem or the beginning of the next stage for the speaker. Which is kind of the point, right? Because if you're finished knowing, then you don't know whether there is something else. You are no longer using your brain in that way. So by giving us an open ending, the poem is actually showing us what it feels like to be finished knowing. Like if we, if the punctuation were different, like and finished knowing, period, then, then we would know that the word then gives us the next stage, right? After the speaker has finished with sense and reason, after the speaker has finished with knowing, something new happens. But in that case, it would be very certain. It would be certain that the speaker has finished with all that and is beginning something new. But if you're finished with knowing, if you no longer use your brain in this way, how can you be certain? You can't. And that's why this ending is so open-ended. So back to the original question, are sense and reason positive in this poem? Two groups took this question and they both said no. Right? Sense breaking through is like an extreme situation when dealing with this annoying, like kind of funeral. And then reason is what is the last obstacle preventing the speaker from moving on to something new or something else. So it seems like in this poem, the speaker is trying to get away from sense and reason, as if the world that exists currently has no space for the speaker and the speaker's silence. Think about this imagery, right? The speaker gets annoyed by groups of mourners walking around. The speaker gets annoyed at the priest who's giving the service, who's talking. And the poem portrays sense and reason and knowing or thinking as negative. So it's like the speaker wants to get away from people, wants to get away from language, wants to get away from sense and reason and thinking. It's like the speaker wants to get away from intentional conscious thought. So one understanding of this poem could be that Dickinson is talking about her own anxiety and overthinking. She can't deal with her own mind in this moment. She wants it all to stop. And she's imagining, maybe, that if finally she could enjoy the silence of her own mind, it might open up new worlds for her. It might give her more possibilities, as one group mentioned. If she can stop overthinking, maybe she could feel more, do more, write new and more interesting or important or fulfilling poetry, maybe. That's one interpretation. But in any case, reason and sense, which are usually seen as positive in this poem are, I think most people would agree, portrayed negatively. Next one, why are some people contented or to die? Like, what does that mean? So let's look at this poem. My portion is defeat today, a paler luck than victory. So with these two lines, the speaker is putting themselves on the side of the losers. 
This peons, fewer bells, the drums don't follow me with tunes. Defeat, a somewhat slower means, more arduous than balls. So these two lines are saying, defeat kills me just like being shot. It's just slower. A ball here is probably a musket ball, mao chang dan. Like it's like a round iron ball. Could also be cannon balls. Like a this is just small. Cannon balls. Uh just a hall. But like at that time, cannon balls did not explode. They were just big iron balls. Um, so she's saying defeat is or the speaker is saying defeat is killing them just a very slow way. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess it's called Sijingdan or something. It doesn't explode. Tis populous with bone and stain. Tis means it is. So what is it? Uh, the previous subject is defeat. So I think we're still talking about the losers. Tis populous with bone and stain. So like the group of losers are filled with uh, injured people, right? Injured, you can see their bones. Uh, they're stained with blood. And men too straight to stoop again. So there are two readings of this line. The first reading is also as a physical injury. They've been injured in such a way that they can no longer bend down. The second interpretation is as a mental state. They are so proud that they would never stoop for anyone. They would never bend down, never bow to anyone. And piles of solid moan. Like the, the pain and suffering are so much that everybody is moaning so much it's like there's a pile of moans and chips of blank in boyish eyes this is also a brilliant line first of all men but in fact they're still boys and then you have blank in their eyes like they're traumatized right just like there, there's, they have empty stares. There's nothing in. They're so traumatized they don't know how to think or they don't react to their situation. But finally, even this traumatic stare are only chips, fragments, parts. Even their traumatized stare is not complete. They are no longer complete men or even complete boys. Something is now missing from their mental state. And scraps of prayer. Again, a great line. Of course, when you're facing death, many people would pray. But in this case, they can only manage parts of prayer, scraps, the parts that they still remember, the parts that they still believe in. And death surprise stamped visible in stone. Uh, these two lines are talking about a tombstone, Mu Bei. They are surprised by death. And the only trace we have left of that surprise is on the stone of their tombs, right? Because now they're dead. So like this stanza is talking about the losers, how they're suffering, how they are they have been traumatized and how some of them have died, how there's barely any hope left. And the line nine might even be about how they're still so proud of like their efforts. They're somewhat prouder over there. So we've been talking about the losers, but the winners over there are even prouder. The trumpets tell it to the air. So they're over there blowing victory trumpets. How different victory to him who has it over there and the one over here who to have had it would have been contented or to die. So the winners have victory, but we losers, we 
in order to get victory, we would be willing to die. We would have been willing to die in order to win. Which is, of course, a paradox, right? Because if you're dead, you're not a winner. Like if you're you have to live in order to be a winner, as you can see from the group over there, right? They're still alive. They're blowing trumpets. So this third stanza kind of gives us a picture of like either you're alive and a winner or you're dead and a loser. But this group of losers, including the speaker, has the worst of both worlds. They are alive and losers. So they not only have to suffer the physical and mental imagery, they also have to suffer the fact that they have lost. And maybe that's why they would rather have died, right? At least it, when if you're die if you're dead, uh, you don't have to suffer this. Now again, this poem could be one long metaphor. Pretty sure Dickinson didn't fight in the Civil War. Um, so when she says, or when the when she writes, "My portion is defeat today," this tells me that. Um, maybe she wrote this poem when she received some news about some failure. She's trying to do something. She failed and she feels like crap. And in fact, in the third stanza, it kind of tells us that she sees other people succeed where she has failed. And she's like, I would rather die than see this. So like, I'm just guessing, right? No evidence at all. But maybe she wrote this when she tried to publish one of her poems and the editor rejected it. And when she got that edition of the newspaper, she saw somebody else's poem was published. So it's like, yeah, today my poem didn't get published. I feel tortured. I feel injured. I feel traumatized. And yet over there, that guy, is proud and boasting about how his poem was published. I would rather die. Is one possible interpretation. And finally, why does Dickinson use so many dashes? What effect do they produce? Nobody chose this question, so it's my question. Uh, so we already looked at one good example, right? The the use of dashes between then creates different interpretations. It creates uncertainty, which fits the theme of this poem. Um, so instead of more actual punctuation, right? If this were a period, then would be a new sentence. If this were a comma, then would probably be part of the previous sentence. Instead of giving us certainty, it lets us decide for ourselves. But what about these dashes at the end of the line? Tis populous with bone and stain, and then a dash. So it's not like a period. It's not like a comma. It doesn't tell us this part is over. We're moving to the next part. It's saying, like, maybe there's more. Maybe it's not just bone and stain. Maybe there's like body parts. Maybe there's like brain matter. Right? It, it gives you a space to imagine more. Or like this line, and chips of blank in boyish eyes. Chips of blank, dash, in boyish eyes. These two parts fit together, and yet they are separated by a dash. On some level, we're supposed to think about these two parts slightly separate. So first you have chips of blank, and then you have boyish eyes. So the, the idea of blankness or parts of blankness exists kind of separately from where they are located. It's like a free floating kind of blank. And so it it's sort of suggesting that this idea of being traumatized, this idea of not being able to react 
is not just in the eyes of these young men, it's also in the general atmosphere. It's in the general situation. It's what this entire group feels like. It's in the air, as it were. Uh, in fact, we can look at this, the last poem and pay attention to the dashes in this one. She rose to his requirement, dropped the playthings of her life to take the honorable work of woman and of wife. So I think the idea is a young girl gets married. Uh, so the dash here brings us from abstract to a concrete action, right? The requirement is to drop something. So it's emphasizing the negative, right? To drop something is usually negative. So it's telling us that this requirement is a negative requirement. It's a requirement that the speaker does not receive very well. She doesn't take it very well. Of woman and of wife, and then a dash. So it tells us that this thought is not complete. We are going to continue maybe to talk about what this means, the work of woman and of wife. Right? If there's a period here, that actually would tell you, OK, the thought is finished. We're moving on to something else. But by using a dash, it leaves space open for us to think. What is the honorable work of woman and of wife? Why is it not related to playthings? Is it not fun? If aught she missed in her new day, this aught is today is spelled A, A-U-G-H-T, which means anything. If anything she missed in her new day of amplitude or awe, amplitude means width, guangdu. Uh, so her new day, her new life, right? Her new life seems to be more narrow than her old life. It seems to be less wonderful than her old life. Or first perspective, or the gold in using wear away perspective perspective but also perspective means looking to the future so a dash here or first perspective or the gold in using wear away it's telling us like the idea of the perspective or the perspective is similar to amplitude and awe but it's also slightly different. It's like a different element. It's like an element looked at from a different perspective. The gold in using wear away. So here the speaker is comparing herself to gold that is being worn away in her new life. So if she's missing any of this, it lay unmentioned. Notice where this is a comma. This is not a dash. Because the poem or the poet wants us to make this grammatical connection. If, then, therefore you need this comma. This is how punctuation gives us certainty. Okay, so if she's missing all of this stuff in her new life, it lay unmentioned. She didn't say anything. As the sea develop pearl and weed, but only to himself. So in the same way that the rough sea produces pearls and seaweeds. Doesn't tell anyone. Just like the speaker doesn't tell anyone. Only to himself be known the fathoms they abide. So only the speaker knows how deep she is. Only she knows the depth of her own mind, how much capability, how much possibility she has hidden away inside herself. Just like only the sea knows how many pearls and how much seaweed it has in all of its depth. And this dash is also quite interesting. 
just as the sea, blah, 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 but only to himself. Only to himself, what? Pause, be known. So it's emphasizing that solitude again. Even before we see an action, it's emphasizing the isolation of the sea and therefore the isolation of the speaker. And then we once again end with a dash. Dickinson loves to end with a dash. The poem is never finished. The thought is never finished. There's always more. Which fits this poem, right? This poem is about how this woman has levels and layers that her husband cannot understand. And so by not ending, it sort of suggests all of this deeper stuff that only she knows about herself. Okay, do you have questions about today's discussion? Right. Next week, we're going to read a short story by Edith Horton called Roman Fever. Edith Horton is a late, uh, she was born in the late 19th century to high society. She's really filthy rich. But she slowly observed and came to realize that being rich does not make you a good person. That in fact, upper society was just as uh, had just as terrible humans as the rest of society. So in most of her fiction, which was written in the early 20th century, we have moved into the 20th century, she writes about this high society that she knows, and she writes about their, uh, we call them their trials and foibles. The silly things that happen to them, the way that they are imperfect, and the, the way that they can be stupid and cruel. Roman Fever is a story about two wives of diplomats living in Rome and about how they are supposed to be close friends, but they're really kind of competing with each other. They're competing about the kind of parties they go to. They compete about their husbands. They even compete about their children. And I'll tell you right now, this story has a twist related to their children and whether or not it is really their child. Yeah, okay, so read the story. See you next week.